Hello, everyone. It's good to have you here today. Uh, another beautiful day here in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. Fabulous weather. Uh, I have a lot of toppers, and I'm going to top with this one. Uh, my first topper is, let's see. Yes, I'll go in this order. On Monday, September 23rd, the Vice President and Dr. Jill Biden will travel to Colorado to view damage from recent flooding and survey recovery efforts there. The Vice President's office will be releasing additional information as we get closer to Monday. That's topper number one. Topper number two. On Tuesday, President Obama will travel to New York to attend the Clinton Global Initiative where he and President Clinton will engage in a conversation about the benefits and future of health care reform in America and access to quality health care around the globe. Uh, I know that was confusing. I said that he'll travel to New York. He will be in New York, as you know, uh, for the United Nations General Assembly. Secondly, as you all know, we're following on the announcement that he'll be having this conversation with former President Clinton uh, about the benefits and future of health care reform. Uh, this conversation will take place one week before the health insurance marketplace is open for business, and Americans who do not currently have insurance will be able to sign up for affordable, quality health plans that meet their needs. This conversation between the two presidents will follow up on the health care speech President Clinton gave in Arkansas in early September and is part of a ramped up public education effort to reach Americans who want to sign up for new affordable options in the health insurance marketplaces from October through March. Finally, uh, <clears throat> today the Senate Judiciary Committee approved Nina Pillard's nomination to be a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. There are now two highly qualified nominees for this court pending before the full Senate, and we urge their prompt confirmation. As you may know, Pillard's career includes landmark accomplishments on behalf of women and families. Uh, she helped defend the constitutionality of the Family and Medical Leave Act and uh, helped open the doors of the Virginia Military Institute to female students. Today, Pillard is a professor at Georgetown Law School, and I would remind you that the D.C. Circuit has a strong tradition of judges who were previously innovative scholars, and that would include Antonine Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Some Republicans continue to cynically raise arguments about that court's workload, even though the court is more than a quarter vacant today. During the last administration, these very same senators confirmed judges to the 9th, 10th, and 11th seats on this very same court. And earlier this year, these same senators confirmed judges to circuit courts with fewer pending appeals per active judge uh, than is the case at the D.C. Circuit. Right now, there are 14 judicial nominees pending in the Senate including 12 who have the unanimous support of the Judiciary Committee, and we urge the Senate to consider Nina Pillard's nomination and all of the President's judicial nominees without delay. Uh, that was a lot of toppers. Maybe we can just wrap it up, or I'll take your question. Yes? I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Um, today, House Speaker John Boehner said the House won't vote to increase the debt limit without including some spending cuts to reduce the deficit. Um, is the President willing to give them? The President has been and is willing to negotiate with Republicans over uh, a broad compromise on budget, on funding and spending. He has put forward his own proposal to do that, and he urges Congress to act to make sure the government does not shut down and continues to be funded, uh, and uh, if necessary to pass a short-term extension. Uh, of funding at current levels in order to allow for further negotiations uh, on a broader budget agreement. I would note that in keeping with his promises uh, and the Democrats in keeping with their promises, the President submitted a budget that represented compromise and tough choices for Democrats with broad-based deficit reduction uh, achieved through a balanced approach. Uh, the Senate passed its own budget. Uh, as Republican leaders insisted, they must. Uh, at the time, Republican leaders said, we have to have regular order. We have to have a situation where the House passes a budget, the Senate passes a budget, and then uh, in accordance with regular order, a conference is established and uh, a product is produced. 
Except when that happened and the Senate passed a budget, the House decided it did not want to join in a conference, and the House, House Republican leaders have refused to name conferees for the budget now uh, for about six months. So uh, that's a laying of the down of the facts here when it comes to the President's willingness to compromise, to achieve uh, resolution and find common ground on budget issues, and he looks forward to doing that uh, in the future. On the matter of the debt ceiling, the answer is no. We will not negotiate over Congress's responsibility to pay the bills that Congress incurred. Congress's responsibility enshrined in the United States Constitution, which gives Congress power over the purse springs, uh, purse strings here in this country, uh, to responsibly ensure that we do not default, that the United States uh, is good, uh, is true to its word, and that uh, our, our full faith and credit will be upheld. It, it's, uh, it's unconscionable to imagine that there are those in the Congress, and now apparently because uh, he couldn't persuade them otherwise, the Speaker of the House has joined them, who believe that it is the right thing to do to uh, threaten another recession threaten, you know, eco economic calamity in this country and the globe uh, over their ideological desire to defund or delay the Affordable Care Act. You know, we, we, we've had this battle. That's how it works. You, you write legislation, you propose legislation, you pass legislation, it becomes law. If people think it's inappropriate or unconstitutional, they take it to the Supreme Court, through the court system to the Supreme Court. In this case, that's what happened, and the Supreme Court upheld the law, and we're implementing the law. Uh, and if members of the Republican Party want to continue to try to overturn the law uh, through legislation, they can. They have been doing that nonstop for the past several years. But they should not hold the full faith and credit of the United States hostage to their insistence that, you know, they get what they want in a manner that they couldn't get through legislation. That's our position. Um, will the White House urge House Democrats to vote for a clean debt ceiling, even though it would be a uh, be at a level reflecting a continuation of the sequester? Oh, as I said the other day, and I think as recently as yesterday, and I think the SAP uh, that we put out, the Statement of Administration Policy, says that we would be willing to accept a so-called clean CR at current uh, spending levels for, for several months to allow for a continued negotiations over a broader budget deal. What we won't accept is further cuts in uh, important investments in our economy. Uh, I think it's worth noting that the Republican, House Republican budget approach enshrined in the, in the Ryan budget was rejected by House Republicans, who could not even pass uh, a transportation and housing bill uh, out of committee. Uh, I think that demonstrates that even the, the Ryan budget is not acceptable even among uh, House Republicans. So. Uh, but to answer your question, we would accept a clean CR uh, for a short term in order to continue to negotiations, continue to negotiations over how we can uh, find agreement over funding the government, ensuring that we're protecting the middle class and, and helping it grow, that we're creating jobs and that we're reducing our deficit in a responsible way. What uh, you know, Speaker Boehner didn't note in his presentation today is that the deficit has been coming down dramatically. It has been coming down and is now uh, slated to be half the size it was when the President took office, uh, despite the enormous uh, economic uh, challenges that our nation faced when the President did take office and, and all that we had to do to avert a depression. Uh, but there is more work to be done, and we can responsibly reduce our deficit in the mid and long term uh, and fund our necessary priorities to help the economy grow and help the middle class and create good paying jobs here in the United States through investments in education and innovation, research and development and infrastructure. Uh, we just have to do it in a responsible way. And we can't, we can't go to the nation, or we shouldn't, they shouldn't go to the nation and say, you know, we couldn't get this through normal means, so we're going to threaten your job, your welfare, your security and future uh, so that we can defund Obamacare or delay it, a proposition would act, which would actually increase the deficit. So this is supposed to be all about spending, 
but they want to increase the deficit to get what they what their ideology ideology demands uh, and I think we've seen not just coming from here but from all corners inclu including many corners within the Republican Party uh, the view that this is a bad idea. It's bad for the economy, it's bad for the middle class, it's bad for the Republican Party. Uh, obviously that's for Republican Party leaders and members to sort out what's good for them politically. What we know is that this approach is bad for the American people. Can you just yeah. talk about Sunday? Is there any more you can tell us about the President's plans at the memorial service? Is he going to speak? And might we hear anything about gun control like after uh, Newtown? I don't have a preview uh, beyond what I uh, announced yesterday. Uh, I think the President uh, might speak, but I don't have anything more specific uh, than that to say uh, about it. When we have more information, we'll provide it. Yes. On Syria, um, in his interview with Fox, um, President Assad said that he thought it would cost about a billion dollars to destroy Syria's stockpile of chemical weapons. And he said that um, he suggested that the United States should pay for it. I'm wondering, is the United States willing to finance the cost of destruction of? Well, I think that uh, a couple of things. He also said that somebody else was responsible for uh, mass murder of civilians using chemical weapons, including children. Uh, and I suppose if you use poison gas to murder your own people, including the children of your own nation, you probably would deny it publicly. Uh, we're working with uh, the Russians on a framework that Secretary Kerry and uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov worked out with their teams uh, to implement uh, a program that would ide identify, verify, uh, and remove from Assad's control the chemical weapons stockpiles in that country. And this is obviously a complicated piece of business. I don't have uh, cost figure associated with it. What I can tell you is that it would be in the interest of the Syrian people, the interest of the people of the region, the interest of the United States uh, and the people of the world uh, to see those chemical weapons stockpiles safely removed from Syria or removed from Assad's control and destroyed so that he cannot use them again uh, in the uh, deplorably indiscriminate way that he used them against his own people. The cost yeah, I don't have, I don't, I, I don't even, I mean, I, the, the, the folks working on the details of the plans we might have more information about, uh, you know, the, the, what, what it would take, what it will take to uh, bring about the identification and transfer and ultimate destruction of the chemical weapons, uh, and we're working uh, with our teams uh, on that. Uh, but uh, two things I would say is that the use of those weapons is the absolute clear responsibility of Assad. The UN report, the inspector's report, uh, reinforces what we've been saying and what many nations around the world have agreed with us in saying uh, that Assad was responsible for the attacks on August 21st. Attempts to suggest otherwise have become farcical in their uh, weirdness uh, and their disassociation from established facts. Uh, but none of that matters so much as the fact that Syria has now, for the first time in its history, acknowledged that they have chemical weapons and agreed to uh, rid themselves of chemical weapons. And Russia has obviously joined with the United States in uh, producing this framework for achieving that. Now there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but this is a significant development over these past days, uh, and we're going about the business of uh, trying to make it happen. Looking ahead to next week, are you moving toward some kind of encounter at the UN between President Obama and President Rouhani, given the... We have no meetings scheduled, uh, as I said yesterday. We have uh, met with the Iranians through the P5 plus one process. We communicate with the Iranians through a variety of methods, as we've said in the past. Uh, president Obama and the new President Rouhani have exchanged letters, as President Obama noted in a couple of interviews. It has long been the position of President Obama since he was a candidate, and this was a matter of debate uh, during the Democratic primaries in 2008, as well as during the general election, 
that he would, as president, be willing to have bilateral negotiations with the Iranians, provided that the Iranians were serious about addressing the international community's insistence that they give up their nuclear weapons programs. That is the position that we hold today. I, I, the first words he uttered after he took the oath of office uh, included uh, this sentence, he being the president. To those who cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side of history. But that we, we will, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist, and that was a reference in his inaugural address to uh, his his position, stated during the campaign and throughout his presidency, that uh, he'd be willing to have direct conversations and negotiations with the Iranians, provided that the Iranians were serious about. Uh, ridding themselves of their nuclear we weapons program and, and honoring the international commitments that they've made. Now, there have been a lot of very interesting things said out of the uh, out of Tehran and the new government and, and encouraging things, but actions are more important than words. And uh, one of the reasons why we're seeing this uh, change in rhetoric, we believe, is because, well, we know, is because of the international consensus that has been established at the, with the President's leadership uh, behind the proposition that Iran must give up its nuclear weapons program. And that consensus has been backed with the most severe sanctions regime in history. And that sanctions regime has inflicted enormous harm on the Iranian economy. And uh, the new President has made clear that he wants to, or has says that he wants to address that problem. And to do that, he needs to uh, demonstrate that he's serious about resolving this conflict with the international community. Uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, instead of going regular order here, I'm going to start on the right. Starting on the right. Um, can I get your reaction to uh, Ann Curry's interview with Iran's president, uh, just sort of following up on these questions, in which he says that he doesn't plan to make a chemical weapon. But then when he was asked about uh, Israel. I, I think you mean, sorry. Uh, I'm weapon. sorry. Yes, sorry. Nuclear. And then when he was asked about Israel, though, he described Israel as an occupier and a usurper government. So first of all, could you respond to his initial comments uh, about Well, as I was just saying uh, in answer to Roberta, we, uh, there's no question that the new Re Iranian government has been uh, taking a different approach in the things that it has said about uh, a lot of issues. Uh, and it has taken some actions. Uh, that uh, suggests a new approach, but uh, and that and and I don't want to diminish that. That's obviously uh, welcome. And as I said yesterday, we are interested in testing uh, the seriousness of those assertions, the desire, the stated desire by the new government to improve its relationships with the international community, uh, knowing that the only way to do that is to deal with this problem. So, uh, I, I, so I would put that statement in that interview in, within the context of other things that have been said along those lines. Uh, and, uh, and then the second question. The comments about Israel, he calls it a usurper government. When he was asked directly about whether he believed whether the Holocaust was a myth, he sort of dodged that question. <clears throat> so how do you square Well, I think that's obviously – uh, I, I didn't see the, the full text of the interview, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking your description of it uh, in answering this question. But, uh, you know, th these are obviously important issues, and we have seen uh, certainly from the uh, <coughs> President Rouhani's predecessor, you know, uh, incredibly offensive statements with regards to Israel and, and, and uh, the Jewish people. So, uh, we, you know, we, we are assessing and evaluating uh, all the things that the new government is saying and doing. See the interview does, or the uh, transcript? The president is very, uh, as he always is, up to date on developments on this issue. I don't know that he saw the interview, but I know he's uh, certainly aware of uh, many of the things that the new president has been saying and, and members of his government have been saying. And then on Syria, uh, yesterday a State Department spokesperson said about the Saturday deadline for Assad turning over. Uh, his list of chemical weapons, she said, quote, we've never said that was a hard and fast deadline. So 
do you expect to actually get a full accounting of Assad's chemical weapons by the first deadline? Uh, and well, is what, it a let hard me, let, me be, let me be clear about, uh, about that. Um, you know, we developed this framework because it is our stated goal to prevent Assad from ever using chemical weapons again. Uh, and fulfilling this framework by removing those weapons from his control and destroying them would achieve that goal. Uh, we believe the situation is so serious that action needs to be taken as swiftly as possible so the Assad regime can never use these weapons again. And we expect the Syrian regime to abide by the timeline in the framework and for Russia to hold the Assad regime to account. Now, we would need to stress that these are timelines and goals, and we are all aware that something as complicated as destroying a massive stockpile of chemical weapons uh, takes time. And as we've said, deadline. well, the, the framework makes a distinction, and this is what's important, and this goes to the question, between the initial information uh, provided by Syria that uh, would fall under a one-week time frame and the formal CWC declaration, the Chemical Weapons Convention declaration, which is on a 30-day time frame. So uh, we are looking at both, and we will evaluate Syria's uh, compliance as we see information from Syria. So I just want to be clear, if they don't give you a full accounting by Saturday, it doesn't necessarily indicate the deal has I mean, there is an initial, uh, you know, provision of information, and that is the one-week deadline, and we'll evaluate compliance when we see what the Syrians have provided, and then, and then there's the 30-day deadline uh, in accordance with the convention. Yes. Thanks, Jake. Um, not asking you about a Fed action, but asking you about the President's performance on the economy. When the Fed says that the economy is simply not strong enough to take the training wheels off, is that not an indictment of the President's policies since he's had five years now? No. I think that, uh, again, without commenting on Fed policy, it is something that this President says every time he speaks about the economy, that we have more work to do. Uh, what uh, all the actions taken uh, at various levels to uh, address the severe economic straits we were in as a nation uh, were meant to do was to help propel this economy uh, in a different direction. You got us out no. of another potential depression, but again, the I think economy the, has not propelled. They haven't taken the training. The economy, why is that? The economy is not where we need it to be. Right. What, what is true is that the economic policies that produced the worst recession in our lifetimes, that had us headed for a global depression uh, with the prospect of 25 percent unemployment, uh, created a situation where we, when the President was taking office, the nation was losing 800,000 jobs a month. The nation's economy was contracting at an annual rate of 8 uh, percent. We ultimately lost more than 8 million jobs. Uh, and Thanks to the grit and determination and resilience of the American people, uh, thanks to the policies that were put in place uh, in the months and uh, years after the economic collapse, we have seen this country grow steadily and produce seven and a half million private sector jobs. By definition, that is not uh, a completion of the job. And the fact is the unemployment rate is still too high. Too many Americans are still looking for jobs. And that's why uh, we should be investing in education, not slashing education, which uh, Republicans, especially in the House, say we should be doing. It's why we should be investing in our infrastructure uh, to create jobs today and create the foundation for future job growth and economic growth uh, down the line. And we should be investing in research and development. And, uh, other aspects of our economy that help, the, uh, will help it grow and help it create jobs. Instead of cutting all that right. in order, in part, to preserve tax breaks for corporations that are unnecessary or, uh, or other uh, privileges that don't help our economy grow. Except uh, on that point of education, uh, August 2nd, 2011, the President signs the Budget Control Act of 2011, the last time we had this big debt ceiling fight, uh, into law, and he says we get $2 trillion in deficit reduction, the President says. Quote, yet it also allows us to keep making key investments in things like education and research that lead to new jobs and assures we're not cutting too abruptly while the economy is still fragile. August 2011, 
here we are more than two years later. You're saying the same thing about we need to invest in education. And how many jobs have we, has the economy you created so since then? Million. And Bernanke yesterday said the, it's not keeping but, up, that people are leaving the workforce. I, I feel, That's why I don't we, You and I, we're going to do this on Crossfire one day, I promise. But, uh, and, and let's be clear that I'll be on one side and you'll be on the other. But, uh, what was true then is true today, that we need to continue to invest in education. We need to continue to invest in infrastructure. We need to continue to invest but in areas of- 2011 did that, according to the president. Two years okay, later- Okay, first of all, as we discussed yesterday, you need to, we need to help you with your facts about what happened in 2011. The, well, there was, again, as, as you, there was a $1.1 trillion non-defense discretionary cut, which allowed for us to preserve uh, key investments in education and elsewhere. There was an addition, an addition, a call for additional deficit reduction, uh, which the President proposed a plan to do, uh, which was balanced, and the Republicans rejected. The Super Committee was tasked with finding, out, finding a way to achieve that, and if that was not achieved, after another year, uh, the sequester would kick into place. Now, the sequester is indiscriminate across the board cuts, which Republicans bemoaned until lacking an alternative they celebrated, uh, including significant cuts to our uh, uh, military readiness and, uh, and, and, and cuts to Head Start and other programs that are uh, vital to millions of American families across the country. So again, if, you, if you're suggesting by this that we ought to be cutting education, you should say so. If you're suggesting we ought to be cutting, that's what the Republican budget proposes, that we ought to be cutting, uh, we, we ought not to be funding infrastructure. Said we were making those investments. Two years later, the Fed we, says, it's just not growing. Ed, have we been growing? Has the economy been growing? There's yes, it is. Those are facts. That's what he said. He said it's just not growing quick enough for us to take the trading wheels off. The president entirely that we need to continue to make the key investments to have the economy grow and create jobs. And he agrees entirely with those who would say that the economic policies that were in place that helped precipitate the worst financial crisis and the worst economic crisis in our lifetimes are mirrored by the Republican proposals that we see today. Republicans have put forward ideas that would bring us back to policies that, that caused the worst job loss of our lifetimes. That's a bad idea. Uh, last one is, um, since you said you wanted to focus on facts, yesterday you and the President talked about how uh, <laughs> never in the history of America has the debt ceiling been used to extort a President. You probably saw the Washington Post looked at that. Mm -hmm looked at the facts and gave you four Pinocchio. So are you going to correct that today? Or? There is no question that prior to 2011, there has never been a case where one party with one ideological agenda has threatened to default on the United States obligations Except for the first time in its, did not, was, 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 was default. Mr. Dixon wanted to lift the debt and, ceiling and Ted Kennedy and, and other and Democrats and brought up a campaign finance reform bill because of Watergate, correct? No question. Was anybody party threatening to fall? Party, right? Was Kennedy. anybody threatening to fault? Was anybody saying, if I don't get this, if I don't get what I want, we'll allow the economy to default? He was demanding. I want a no. campaign finance Ed, reform bill. We're days away. Ed, again, go look at the facts. So go look at the Washington history. Post give you four Pinocchios. Or just you can ask the, uh, the Washington Post. You continue to say this has never happened before. Ed, why don't, why don't we look at uh, what Republicans have said? Threatening to fall is Washington a bad Post idea. Said. You still have an answer. The Washington Post says, Does anybody else want to uh, watch well, Ed and me debate? Four Pinocchios. Yeah, I said, <laughs> it is absolutely correct that be prior to 2011, no, no party to the budget agreements of the past had ever threatened default if it did not get its way ideologically. It did not happen. And in 2011, we saw it happen. And even the flirtation with default, the fact that there were members of Congress on Capitol Hill who said we should default rather than reach an agreement with President Obama, a compromise with President Obama, that took an enormous toll on our economy. And, you know, people who think that this is fun and games ought to tell it to those people who did not get jobs in August of 2011 or September of 2011 because of that behavior. People who, you know, struggle to pay their bills for longer than they should have because of that decision. It was a mistake then, and I think the American people saw it as a mistake, and a lot of people, including a lot of Republicans, see it as a mistake today. Jim. Uh, Jay, uh, what has the President done in the last 24 hours to prevent a shutdown or a default? The President uh, spoke with uh, Is he just stepping back and watching the Republicans duke it out? Is that what the strategy is? Well, he didn't make any else? videos. Uh, but he did meet with uh, leading members of the business community. Uh, he, he did meet with leading members of the business community. 
uh, to talk about the need for all of us to work together to grow the economy, uh, ensure that the middle class is strong and getting stronger, uh, and to avoid both a government shutdown and a default. Uh, I think you saw a statement from the Chamber of Commerce. You saw, you've seen statements from across the board, including, as I've noted, uh, from Republicans of all stripes who believe that the uh, strategy, if you can call it that, uh, employed by House Republicans uh, is a recipe for economic disaster and, at least according to them, trouble for the Republican Party. Uh, the President has made clear that he's willing to discuss how we grow, move forward on our budget issues. He's put forward a compromise budget proposal. He spent uh, a lot of time this year meeting with Republicans who said they were interested in finding common ground on our budget challenges. Uh, and even as he has done that, we've presided over economic growth and job creation and a reduction of our deficit by half. Uh, he understands we need to do more, but we need to do it in a way that's fair to the middle class. What is not fair to the middle class is a shutdown that hurts the middle class. What is not fair to the middle class is default uh, for the sake of uh, the ideological goal of defunding or delaying the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's a, I'm either going to take your job, uh, you make sure you lose your job, or uh, take away your access to health insurance. That's the choice. Are you quietly rooting for Ted Cruz? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that somebody suggested he might be uh, a secret ally uh, of the Democrats. I'm not sure that's the case, but I think that a lot of uh, people have noted that the effort to defund the Affordable Care Act uh, is going nowhere and uh, wasting time on it when we have urgent deadlines to protect our economy uh, and allow it to grow and help the middle class uh, is uh, quixotic at best. And Jay, the, uh, speaking of uh, Obamacare and, and jobs lost, the Cleveland Clinic uh, uh, says uh, that because of uh, concerns with health care reform, it's cutting $330 million out of its budget that there may be jobs lost as a result. What does the President have to say to Americans who may lose their jobs due to the implementation of Obamacare? Well, I, I have not seen uh, uh, any specifics, uh, specifics on that particular report. What I can say is that there is no data that bears out the, the assertion that uh, the economy is losing jobs because of the implementation, implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, what we have seen uh, even though, even though you, uh, again, saying that Jim, I appreciate it, and I'm saying I don't, I, like, I don't know that, I, I don't uh, know the details of that story. What I can tell you is that when Republicans stand up and say that the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare uh, is uh, raising health care costs, they stand there and say that with a straight face, knowing that the last three years have uh, seen a reduction in the growth of health care. Uh, that are the, the, the lowest increase in health care costs in 50 years, in the three years since the Affordable Care Act was passed. Okay? So the, the health, cost of health care uh, has been, the rate of increase has been going down dramatically. And uh, partly that is due to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, what we have seen in the data is that the vast majority of the jobs created of those 7.5 million, vast majority, are full-time jobs, not part-time jobs, as you know, Republicans and opponents of the uh, Affordable Care Act will tell you, again, contradicting the evidence, uh, that uh, people are making are only uh, creating part-time jobs uh, in so order to... You're saying that there's no evidence that any jobs will be lost I'm saying due that to the implementation There's no data that backs that up. I'm not saying that there isn't anecdotal evidence. There's some anecdotal evidence, you know, some, some people... There's been an ongoing trend of employers, for example, uh, shedding uh, employees from employer-sponsored health care plans. One of the reasons why we needed health care reform was to deal with that growing problem. Uh, and, then some, and then when you see some employers say, well, now we're continuing that trend, but this time we're going to blame it on a new law, uh, it doesn't really, uh, you know, pass the seriousness test because this has been a trend that's been ongoing for a long time. And one of the reasons why, for people who cannot or do not have access to employer-based insurance can now buy, when the marketplaces are in, in effect, can now buy uh, insurance at affordable rates that they could not buy before. They did not have access to affordable rates. I said the other day uh, that there was a study that just came out that showed that uh, nearly six in ten Americans who are uninsured will have access to health insurance at a cost of less than $100 per month. 
And if all governors follow the Republican governors uh, in some states who have uh, fully implemented uh, or are fully implementing the Affordable Care Act, including the expansion of Medicaid, that nearly 8 in 10 uninsured Americans would have that access. Uh, and that's a huge deal for those Americans. It may not be a huge deal for people who don't really offer alternatives or care that much about whether those uninsured Americans get health insurance, but it certainly matters to them and their families. And you mentioned the video. You were obviously referring to Speaker Boehner's video. Is that right? The Might video that, that, he, that his <laughs> office put out this morning saying that the president is more willing to negotiate with Vladimir Putin than he is with House Republicans? Uh, I'd say two things. One is the president uh, uh, will yeah, be. You, you, can, you can expect uh, uh, that is irrefutably false. Uh, the president right. spent an enormous amount of time with uh, John Boehner over the years. Uh, and I have no doubt, and you can expect, that the President will be uh, in conversations with congressional leaders in the coming days about the need to deal with these pressing deadlines. Uh, but the video, I thought, demonstrated a little Putin envy, uh, a little odd bit of Putin envy on behalf of the Speaker, but uh, uh, maybe he can explain that. What is Putin envy John? exactly? Is uh, Jay, the uh, President's uh, ambassador at large for war crimes issues, Stephen Rapp, said uh, yesterday that President uh, Assad should absolutely be charged for crimes against humanity and war crimes. Is it the policy of the U.S. government that Assad should be charged for war crimes? Uh, there is no doubt that the Assad regime is responsible for crimes against humanity and violation of the laws of war. Since the regime began its brutal campaign against the Syrian people, the United States has been clear that those responsible for the atrocities in Syria must be held accountable. We have worked to support efforts by the international community to gather evidence that could help build the foundation for future efforts to hold accountable those responsible for those atrocities in Syria. And these efforts include the UN Independent Commission of Inquiry on Syria, established by the UN Human Rights Council, and the Syrian Justice and Accountability Center, an independent organization that the inter international community established in 2012. Uh, you know, so it's our view that Assad and his regime are responsible uh, for these, and we have undertaken all these efforts that I just described. So are you saying it is the policy that Assad should be charged with war crimes? Again, our position is that those responsible for the atrocities in Syria, atrocities that are clearly crimes against humanity, uh, must be held accountable. Syria itself is not an ICC state party, and we have seen that there is no realistic prospect that the Security Council will refer the Syrian situation to the ICC or agree to establish a UN tribunal, as was done for the former Yugoslavia and R Rwanda. But we still believe that those responsible for these atrocities must be held accountable. So I want to ask you about something you said at least twice over the past week uh, from that podium. You said that Assad, in a network interview, uh, claimed that he did not have chemical weapons. What were you talking about? And is that he has, true? He has, uh, prior to the agreement by the Syrian government, the Assad government, to uh, the Russian proposition agreed to with the United States that this Assad would give up his chemical weapons. They have insisted for years that they do not possess chemical weapons. And when asked, they have demurred or refused to answer or said at different times that they don't have them. Uh, I don't think anybody doubts that that was their position and that it has changed uh, in the wake of the threat of the credible threat of U.S. force in response to Assad's use of chemical weapons and uh, the developments that we've seen since then. Jay, you have said before that you would never, it's important to have credibility and to get the facts right mm -hmm. on the podium. So I'm just asking you very specifically, because you said this twice, you said, and the most recent one was just on Monday, President Assad, in a taped interview, appeared on a network claiming that Syria did not have chemical weapons. You said that it was a week ago today. Look, I, I don't have the transcript of the interview. There's I no question it, I, that- I, it, I have it here. He did not say In fact, he said exactly the opposite. He said, we never said that we have it, and we never said that we don't have it. Well, now you said what, okay. twice. John, I'm just asking. Okay, you, fair what, point. Did you speak inaccurately? Was that inaccurate? I will concede, having not seen the transcript recently, that uh, he did not, taking your word for it, say we don't have them. He refused to answer the question, and for 20 years, Syria refused to answer the question. If it is now ABC's position that in fact Syria has all along 
ABC admitted. Position. I'm trying to get at it, whether or not you are speaking accurately from the podium. And, and if you want to correct the record, I, that's fine. I will. Because, because Assad said in his latest hey, interview that, that, that he's never said one way or the other, and you've said otherwise. I'm just, you know, and it's a matter of credibility. Here. Five nations in the world, Syria among them, have refused to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention. I understand uh, so, what you said about okay, the interview and I'm, and I'm gave last week. What was clear from that interview, and I accept your uh, the time you spent dissecting these words, but I accept that that, that Assad did not uh, admit that he had chemical weapons, uh, nor did he deny that he had them. What the world has known for 20 years since uh, the CWC was open for signatories is that Syria would not admit to having stockpiles of chemical weapons, even though the world knew they had them, and that that changed because of the pressure placed on Syria by the United States uh, and its allies. Major. <coughs> President Rouhani said in his interview that he has complete authority to negotiate a nuclear weapons deal with the United States. Does our, your, this government believe that? What we believe is that the dramatic effects on the Iranian economy of the unprecedented sanctions regime has made it clear to leaders of that country that it would be in their best interests to deal with this problem. Whether they will deal with it remains to be seen. And the President has made it his policy from the time he ran for office and took office that he is willing to uh, meet with, and, and the United States is willing to have bilateral negotiations with Iran if Iran is serious about uh, addressing the problem that the international community uh, asserts that exists, which is that Iran uh, continues to pursue a nuclear weapon. This goes to a, an assessment I'm trying to gather about this new government. About who's in charge. And who's in charge. And what do we deduce differently about Rouhani than we did about Ahmadinejad? And its relationship to the clerics and the leadership above the presidency in Iran. Uh, these are excellent questions and uh, ones that I know keep uh, Iran experts up late at night. Uh, and I think that the only way to know the answer to those questions is to test the proposition, is to test the assertions of uh, the Rouhani government that it wants to improve its relations with the international community, including the United States, uh, knowing that the only way to do with that is to, is to uh, solve this problem, which is come clean with the international community, uh, rejoin it by agreeing to, in a verifiable way, give up its nuclear weapons ambitions. In the last couple of days, Iran has released 11 political prisoners, some of them with mm -hmm. notable histories uh, in Iran. It, Rouhani also said in his interview that he would be open to social media access in Iran that had been denied for years. Where would you place these two developments in the arc of transition Well, I'd say that the Iran? release of political prisoners is a concrete action, and uh, I would say that rhetorically entertaining the idea of uh, providing access to social media is rhetoric, and it's welcome rhetoric, and I, and I think that we are all watching very closely and with interest, and listening closely and with interest to the things that the new leadership has been saying. And we are very interested in testing whether or not their claimed desire to improve relations with the international community will be backed up by action, and we hope it is. Uh, we believe, as we've said all along, that there is still an opportunity to resolve this issue diplomatically. It is certainly in the world's interest to resolve it diplomatically. Uh, and we continue to pursue that through the P5 plus one, through uh, various means. Uh, but actions in this case, uh, words are no substitute for actions. And we need to uh, follow through on these openings and see how serious uh, the Iranians are. I know you you told us there's nothing scheduled in New York. Uh, what I'm more curious about is if it's even too early to suggest a meeting between these two particular leaders. I would say that no, because as I noted uh, when I uh, did not do justice in my reading of a sentence from the President's first inaugural, uh, that he has been saying all along and, and did so as a candidate that he'd be willing to have that meeting and he'd be willing to have the U.S. meet and negotiate directly in a bilateral way with the Iranians, as well as, of course, through the P5 plus one, uh, provided that Iran uh, demonstrates the seriousness 
uh, about dealing with this nuclear weapons program. Uh, and we will see. We will see. Well, I would just say that in general, it's possible, but it has always been possible. The, the, the extended hand has been there from the, the moment the president was sworn into office. More possible considering the events we've just been talking about. I would about. say that, that we obviously notice a significant change in uh, language and tone from the new Iranian government when compared to its predecessor. Uh, it's, it's rather dramatic. But uh, it's important when we're talking about this incredibly serious matter of a nuclear weapons program that uh, we not just take uh, Iran's words for it, that we, that we back it up and see if it's, uh, if it's real. Quick questions on Syria, getting back to what we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. Forgetting or setting aside for a moment the $1 billion figure that Assad mentioned, it seems more substantive question is the willingness of this government to state publicly it will finance to whatever degree necessary because it is such a priority in pursuit of non-proliferation, getting rid of these weapons, mm -hmm. the mechanisms by which they will be destroyed, and that price is really no object, that whatever the price is required, the money will be found, and if it needs to come from the United States, it will be there. I Can think, you say that? Well, I, I think that this is all premature. I haven't seen anything beyond what uh, President Assad has said about knows that. Well, and, it's, and uh, let, let's the just... The commitment of the United States government to prioritize that in tax dollars because it's... Well, we certainly all believe these other that successfully implementing this framework, uh, and by successfully I mean removing from his control Assad's chemical weapons and ultimately destroying them, is very much in the interest of the United States and is, uh, as a matter of cost, uh, you know, comparatively, when you talk about using military force, I, you know, again, not without dealing with numbers, the, you know, the, the use of military force is costly no matter how you look at it, even when you're talking about something uh, of limited duration and scope. So it is profoundly in our interests, and it is uh, a uh, economical proposition, broadly speaking, to remove uh, successfully Assad's weapons uh, from him and destroy them. I would also say that this is a, a goal that is an international goal, and it is a goal that is being worked on with partner nations and worked on uh, with uh, fellow members of the United Nations Security Council. So uh, the responsibility for fulfilling the framework uh, will not rest with the United States alone. One last thing about the Saturday deadline. You obviously know as people scrutinize Syrian compliance, the first and lowest hurdle of that compliance is providing information they already possess. Mm -hmm. That should not be a difficult timeline for the Syrians to meet, since they already have the information mm -hmm. themselves. And any slippage of that Saturday deadline would suggest to people looking on the outside that the United States might be flexible in ways it ought not to be to achieve compliance. Well, again, we will, we will evaluate. The information they already possess should be handed over to prove their seriousness with complying with this particular framework. I wouldn't disagree with that. And I think that uh, we will evaluate uh, Syria's uh, seriousness about compliance based on a variety of uh, benchmarks, and the first one is uh, the seven-day deadline. The expectation of this government is that that information is provided on Saturday and not a day later. We certainly expect that the Sy Syria will uh, uphold its responsibility to provide this initial bit of, uh, piece of information, and we will evaluate their seriousness based on uh, both their timeliness and the content of their submission. Yep. Thank you, Jay. Can you tell us what the White House's purpose was in calling the Hill yesterday on the Fed nomination? I'm not aware that the White House called the Hill on the Fed nomination or any nomination. Uh, I'm not saying, I, you know, I, you have to frame your question in a way that I can answer it. White House and we reported that White House officials uh, placed some calls to banking committee members to talk about the Fed nomination. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have anything new for you on uh, that or any other personnel matter. Yeah. Uh, Jay, uh, the stock market. Of course, yesterday he rose new highs. I'm sure you know about that. Does the this president is an have? Did you say I don't comment on Fed policy? I didn't know that. I'm <laughs> not asking about Fed policy this time. But does the president have any concerns that a potential uh, government shutdown or a potential default or both would uh, damage investor confidence? Oh yes, unquestionably, because history proves that it would be damaging 
to uh, confidence in the U.S. economy, especially uh, when there's even the flirtation with default. We saw it in the summer of 2011. You know, every economist will tell you that uh, our economy took a hit because of uh, the suggestion that we might actually default because of the ideological demands placed on those negotiations by Republicans. The, uh, that was a bad outcome uh, and wholly unnecessary, and we need to make sure that we don't repeat it, which is why we should, when it comes to the responsibility never unmet of ensuring that Congress pays the bills it incurs, it should just be done, and, and nobody should attach uh, poison pills to it and say that if I don't get my poison pill, then let the let default happen. Well, that's just irresponsible, and uh, you know that's the position we've taken because of the threat to our economy that even the flirtation with default poses. Uh, if I'd like to follow up on Majors and a uh, question on Iran, is it, is it accurate then to say that the White House is, is open to or preparing for a meeting? I have, uh, I mean, there are no meetings currently planned. I understand that. And uh, the openness question I answered, we've been open in, as a general proposition to uh, bilateral discussions with uh, the Iranians uh, f since the President took office. And that was a uh, controversial position in the Democratic primaries. It was a controversial position in the general election in 2008, but it was the position the President believed was the right one to take, and it's a position he holds today. It's conditioned upon Iran being serious about wanting to resolve this obstacle, uh, which is its insistence on uh, developing a nuclear weapons program. The, the way to rejoin the international community and uh, relieve the pressure on the Iranian economy that has been imposed on it by this sanctions regime is to come to terms with the international community, forsake and give up in a verifiable way Iran's nuclear weapons program, uh, and, uh, and then move forward. So we're, we believe there's an, a window of opportunity that remains open to do that. It will not remain open forever. Uh, and we have been certainly interested in uh, some of what we have heard from the new Iranian government about their interest in improving relations with uh, the international community. And what about the trip tomorrow? Can you tell us anything? Is that part of the middle class tour? Um, uh, I think we'll have more information on it. But uh, I mean, the answer is he will be obviously talking about the economy. Cheryl. Uh, yesterday. Thing. Yesterday to the business roundtable, um, the president said he was willing to discuss Republican priorities. Is one of those priorities of the Keystone Pipeline? I mean, I, if the president said he was willing to discuss Republican priorities, I think that's consistent with what he's said all along and demonstrated in all the negotiations he's had over the years with Republicans over economic and budget policy. I don't have a specific item to hang on it. The 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 decision about that pipeline obviously is something that's reviewed and evaluated and housed over uh, by and over at the State Department. Uh, so I think what the President said goes to what we've been discussing earlier, which is that when it comes to reaching a broader budget agreement, the President has consistently been willing to seek common ground and to make uh, reasonable concessions to Republicans uh, and to their priorities. What he has not been willing to do is uh, stick it to the middle class in order to achieve some of their ideological uh, agenda priorities, and uh, you know, and 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 reach a compromise that benefits the wealthy and corporations, rewards insurance companies, but doesn't help the middle class. In fact, hurts the middle class. Uh, but as you saw in his budget submission this year, as you saw in his negotiations with the Speaker of the House at the end of last year, he has been willing to put forward a plan that addresses some of their stated priorities and a plan that, that as scored uh, by outside groups, would significantly reduce the deficit uh, further beyond what we've done thus far and do it in a way that goes beyond the sequester, replaces the sequester, but allows for investments in the middle class and investments in our future uh, by doing it in a balanced way.
that's his position uh, as it have as or, as it ever has been. Mr. Nakamura. Okay. Okay. Uh, on immigration, um, the president said the other day in the interview with Telemundo that uh, there's nothing more he can do about deportations. But you know, immigration advocates are calling this a moral crisis. The number of deportations under the Obama administration is the White House basically saying that if Congress does not pass immigration reform. Your hands are tied. There's nothing else you can do, and these high numbers of deportations will continue the next three years. What he has said, and what he said in that interview, is that th there isn't a plan B here to comprehensive immigration reform. And when it comes to deportations uh, or trying to freeze them, uh, he said, "quote To do so would be ignoring the law in a way that I think would be very difficult to defend legally. So that is not an option, and that's that's just the so case." There are no other there's no other things that the White House can do other to stop or pass immigration way. reform, comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, that the the whole purpose of doing immigration reform in a comprehensive way is that uh, doing it that way uh, solves a lot of problems, helps the economy, uh, helps the middle class, uh, increases growth, <laughs> reduces the deficit, uh, and uh, resolves a lot of the problems around the 11 million uh, undocumented people in this country. So, and provides a clear path to citizenship uh, that with a lot of hurdles along the way, but a clear path. So uh, it was that approach that garnered a broad bipartisan majority in the Senate. And, that, and it is that approach that if the Speaker of the House took a break from the Civil War he's engaged in with his own party and put the Senate bill on the floor, would get a majority in the House. And then the President could sign it into law. and do the Republican Party a huge, a huge favor by removing this problem for their political well, future. Allies on immigration, some of the groups and so on have said recent, in recent days after that interview that the president, if immigration reform isn't passed mm -hmm. and some, some ways it's out of the president's hands, he could go down as having one of the worst records on immigration because of those high levels of deportation. So the, the, president, the president is obligated to enforce the law. And uh, as he said in Telemundo, there's not Immigration reform proponents should not believe that there is some plan B here that is a viable alternative to the House of Representatives doing the right thing by America and allowing a bill that has broad support across the country, that has broad bipartisan support in the Senate, come to the floor so that it can be voted on and passed. Just do it. It won't hurt. And, and the benefits will be enormous for the economy, for the middle class, and even for the Republican Party. Uh, Mr. Allen, uh, and then Ari, then April. Two, two quick Congress questions. You said earlier that the President would be in conversations with congressional leaders in the coming days. Can you elaborate on who he will speak with, when, and in what format? Uh, I can only say that you can expect that he'll have uh, conversations with uh, leaders uh, in Congress about these looming deadlines and about the need for Congress to do the right thing, make sure they don't shut down the government, make sure they don't default. I don't have any more uh, uh, details for you. And there are some congressional Democrats that believe a short-term continuing resolution locking in sequester and what they believe are huge cuts in investments to education, infrastructure, other things the President believes in would be a bad thing, perhaps even worse than shutdown. Why is a, a short-term CR better in the President's view? Than shutdown? Yeah. Uh, the administration is willing to support a short-term continuing resolution to allow critical government functions to operate without interruption and looks forward to working with the Congress on appropriations legislation for the remainder of the fiscal year that preserves critical national priorities, protects national security, and makes investments to spur economic growth and job creation for years to come. You know, that's our position, that we should, that, that as an alternative to a bigger budget deal, which unfortunately is, doesn't look achievable between now and October 1st, uh, the government must not be allowed to shut down, and that we would uh, be willing to support a short-term continuing resolution to allow time for further negotiations. We have seen, because of the, in one of the, you know, episodic examples of the House Republicans' inability to uh, pass legislation, the, you know, bill through the uh, Transportation and Housing Committee uh, that was based on the Ryan budget failed. Uh, the Ryan, you know, the, the, the House Republican budget is not an option, obviously. Uh, and we need to negotiate further to find a compromise that allows for uh, investments that are necessary to spur economic growth. Yeah. I think, what did I say, Ari? Yeah. Um, when the and then April. When the president has done Alan, Ari, April.
when the president's done these middle-class economic events on the road before, um, Republicans often accuse him of engaging in campaign-style politics, particularly when there are crises in Washington. Can you address that concern? The President of the United States, as was true of all of his predecessors and will be true of all of his successors, uh, believes that it is absolutely uh, the right thing to do to travel around the country to talk about uh, his agenda and what we need to do as a nation to grow the economy. Uh, you know, he'll continue to do that. And uh, you know, ultimately, members of Congress of both parties should cast their votes based on what they believe is right for the country, not because this president or any president says they should vote one way or the other. And so because we live in a democracy and because we have representative government and we have Congress uh, and two houses of Congress, it's important to talk to the people who then uh, are able to express their own opinion about uh, what they think we should be doing in Washington. And he'll continue to do it. In 2011, it was reported that in the White House, some were arguing that Republicans should get their shutdown and learn their lesson. That's obviously not the White House's public posture now. It's not the President's opinion. But have there been any people in the White House arguing for that this time around? Not that I've heard. I, look, it is, it is not good. Uh, it would not be good for the middle class of this country uh, or for our general economy to see a lapse in the funding of government, essential government operations. It hasn't been in the past and it wouldn't be uh, in the near future. So our, that's why, in answer to Jonathan's question, you know, we are willing to accept a short-term continuing resolution, uh, keeping funding at current levels, to avert a shutdown and allow us time to continue to negotiate over a sensible compromise uh, on a broad, broader budget agreement. All of that would be easier if the House would simply appoint conferees, as they said they would, uh, to negotiate the budget passed by the Senate and the House. Uh, but because they haven't done that for the past six months, you know, we obviously need a little more time, uh, we would support that short-term CR. Uh, but it is not our policy and not our view that a shutdown uh, would be anything but bad. April. Jay, two subjects. Um, debate on the Hill right now. Democrats and Republicans are fighting over SNAP. Uh, where does the White House stand um, when it comes to these large cuts in SNAP? Well, as we said at the time uh, when uh, this was evolving, you know, it's, it's unconscionable in our view uh, to uh, literally take food out of the mouths of hungry Americans uh, in order to, again, achieve uh, some ideological goal. And there's a very interesting article in National Review online right now that argues that this is bad policy for the Republicans, that conservatives are crazy to do this, and they should not do it. It is, it is wrong. This program lifts four million people out of poverty every year. And to punish them uh, when we can protect the most vulnerable Americans, move forward economically, grow our economy, invest in our economy, and reduce the deficit if we do it in a balanced and responsible way is, is just terrible policy, and it's, and it's insensitive. I want to go to another subject. Um, I'm looking at a February 25th, 2013 briefing on whitehouse.gov with Janet Napolitano standing uh, at that podium where you are. Mm -hmm. And all this comes to play in the midst of the possible government shutdown, October 1, and other money woes in October that could be coming. And one thing that's striking, it says, and, and it kind of goes to the Navy Yard situation as well, she responded to Ed Henry and she said, look, I don't think we can maintain the same level of security at all places around the country with sequester as without sequester. Did sequester affect what happened at the Navy Yard? Was there, were there less uh, patrol uh, officers there because of sequester? I, I think I got this question earlier in the week, and, and I, 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 I don't have an answer to that. I've seen some answers uh, from people who are, uh, are, have in-line responsibility for it. Well, from, no, from folks at the Navy or the Navy Yard, uh, and I would refer you to them. I'm, I'm not aware that that was an issue, and I think that what you saw was a rather remarkably fast uh, first responders' response based on the accounts I've read. But 
uh, having said that, I would, I would uh, refer you to the Navy Department, to Pentagon on it. In line on the financial picture, with that, with what General Napolitano said in February, and again, looking at the picture in October, the possibilities of the picture in October, where will the nation stand? I mean, you know, we asked her at that time, would we be vulnerable? She said yes, quote unquote, yes. Will the nation, if there's a shutdown and other things happen in October, how vulnerable will this nation be with sequester already in play? Well, there's no question, April, that a shutdown would have negative effects on millions of people and, and on our economy. Uh, and it's, it's wholly unnecessary to entertain shutdown, again, for the purposes of it, you know, achieving some empty political victory, uh, which would turn to dust and ashes pretty quickly, politically. So uh, we don't need to do that. We need to just responsibly find common sense solutions to our budget challenges and not uh, refight, relitigate old battles. Uh, and in that spirit, we said that we would accept a short-term continuing resolution to allow for further negotiation. Uh, we've also said that in the name of the economy and in the proposition that the United States always pays its bills and meets its obligations, nobody should be entertaining for political purposes the prospects of default. Chris, and then Mike. Thanks, Jay. Uh, the Oklahoma National Guard announced this week that it will no longer accept spousal benefit applications for troops in same-sex marriages despite guidance from the administration saying these benefits should be, should be available nationwide. This means Oklahoma is joining Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana in withhold, withholding these benefits. Is the President aware of this and believe these installations are violating federal policy? Uh, I do not know the answer to the question about the President. I would refer you to the Department of Defense uh, on it, and, and I can take your question, and we can talk about it later. I'm just not aware of these, uh, these developments. Just a quick question, Jay. Why yeah. is the Vice President going to Colorado, not the President? Would the President be looking at a trip later? I don't have any uh, scheduling announcements for the President. Obviously, the President's going to the United Nations General Assembly uh, on Monday and Tuesday, uh, and, and the Vice President is, is going out to view the damage caused by the terrible flooding in Colorado and to meet with uh, affected families. Again, I, I think it's entirely appropriate for the Vice President to make this visit with Dr. Biden. I don't have any other uh, updates on the President's schedule. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for uh, Did you have something? Okay. Thanks, everybody. As you may know, Pillard's career includes landmark accomplishments on behalf of women and families. Uh, she helped defend the constitutionality of the Family and Medical Leave Act and uh, helped open the doors of the Virginia Military Institute to female students. Today, Pillard is a professor at Georgetown Law School, and I would remind you that the D.C. Circuit has a strong tradition of judges who were previously innovative scholars, and that would include Antonin Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Some Republicans continue to cynically raise arguments about that court's workload, even though the court is more than a quarter vacant today. During the last administration, these very same senators confirmed judges to the 9th, 10th, and 11th seats on this very same court. And earlier this year, these same senators confirmed judges to circuit courts with fewer pending appeals per active judge uh, than is the case at the D.C. Circuit. Right now, there are 14 judicial nominees pending in the Senate including 12 who have the unanimous support of the Judiciary Committee, and we urge the Senate to consider Nina Pillard's nomination and all of the President's judicial nominees without delay. Uh, that was a lot of toppers. Maybe we can just wrap it up, or I'll take your question. Yes? I appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. Um, today, House Speaker John Boehner said the House won't vote to increase the debt limit without including some spending cuts to reduce the deficit. Um, is the President willing to give them? The President has been and is willing to negotiate with Republicans over uh, a broad compromise on budget, on funding and spending. He has put forward his own proposal to do that, and he urges Congress to act to make sure the government does not shut down and continues to be funded, uh, and uh, if necessary to pass a short-term extension. Uh, of funding at current levels in order to allow for further negotiations uh, on a broader budget agreement. I would note that in keeping with his promises, 
Uh, and the Democrats, in keeping with their promises, the President submitted a budget that represented compromise and tough choices for Democrats with broad-based deficit reduction uh, achieved through a balanced approach. Uh, the Senate passed its own budget uh, as Republican leaders insisted they must. Uh, at the time, Republican leaders said, we have to have regular order. We have to have a situation where the House passes a budget, the Senate passes a budget, and then, uh, in accordance with regular order, a conference is established and uh, a product is produced. Except when that happened, and the Senate passed a budget, the House decided it did not want to join in a conference, and ha the House, House Republican leaders have refused to name conferees for the budget now uh, for about six months. So uh, that's a laying of the down of the facts here when it comes to the President's willingness to compromise, to achieve uh, resolution and find common ground on budget issues, and he looks forward to doing that uh, in the future. On the matter of the debt ceiling, the answer is no. We will not negotiate over Congress's responsibility to pay the bills that Congress incurred. Congress's responsibility enshrined in the United States Constitution, which gives Congress power over the purse springs, uh, purse strings here in this country, uh, to responsibly ensure that we do not default, that the United States uh, is good. Uh, is true to its word, and that uh, our, our full faith and credit will be upheld. It, it's, uh, it's unconscionable to imagine that there are those in the Congress, and now apparently because uh, he couldn't persuade them otherwise, the Speaker of the House has joined them, who believe that it is the right thing to do to uh, threaten another recession, threaten you know, econ economic calamity in this country and the globe uh, over their ideological desire to defund or delay the Affordable Care Act. You know, we, we, we've had this battle. That's how it works. You, you write legislation, you propose legislation, you pass legislation, it becomes law. If people think it's inappropriate or unconstitutional, they take it to the Supreme Court, or through the court system to the Supreme Court. In this case, that's what happened, and the Supreme Court upheld the law. And we're implementing the law. Uh, and if members of the Republican Party want to continue to try to overturn the law uh, through legislation, they can. They have been doing that nonstop for the past several years. But they should not hold the full faith and credit of the United States hostage to their insistence that, you know, they get what they want in a manner that they couldn't get through legislation. That's our position. Will the White House urge House Democrats to vote for a clean debt ceiling, even though it would be a uh, be at a level reflecting a continuation of the sequester? Oh, as I said the other day, and I think as recently as yesterday, and I think the SAP uh, that we put out, the Statement of Administration Policy, says that we would be willing to accept a so-called clean CR at current uh, spending levels for, for several months to allow for a continued negotiations over a broader budget deal. What we won't accept is further cuts in uh, important investments in our economy. Uh, I think it's worth noting that the Republican, House Republican budget approach enshrined in the, in the Ryan budget was rejected by House Republicans who could not even pass uh, a transportation and housing bill uh, out of committee. Uh, I think that demonstrates that even the, the Ryan budget is not acceptable even among uh, House Republicans. So, uh, but to answer your question, we would accept a clean CR. Uh, for a short term in order to continue to negotiations, continue to negotiations over how we can uh, find agreement over funding the government, ensuring that we're protecting the middle class and, and helping it grow, that we're creating jobs and that we're reducing our deficit in a responsible way. What, uh, you know, Speaker Boehner didn't note in his presentation today is that the deficit has been coming down dramatically. It has been coming down and is now uh, slated to be half the size it was when the President took office, uh, despite the enormous uh, economic uh, challenges that our nation faced when the President did take office and, and all that we had to do to avert a depression. Uh, 
but there is more work to be done, and we can responsibly reduce our deficit in the mid and long term uh, and fund our necessary priorities to help the economy grow and help the middle class and create good paying jobs here in the United States through investments in education and innovation, research and development and infrastructure. Uh, we just have to do it in a responsible way, and we can't, we can't go to the nation, or we shouldn't, they shouldn't go to the nation and say, you know, we couldn't get this through normal means, so we're going to threaten your job, your welfare, your security and future, uh, so that we can defund Obamacare, or delay it, a proposition would act, which would actually increase the deficit. So this is supposed to be all about spending, but they want to increase the deficit to get what they, what their ideology, ideology demands. Uh, and I think we've seen, not just coming from here, but from all corners, inclu including many corners within the Republican Party, uh, the view that this is a bad idea. It's bad for the economy, it's bad for the middle class, it's bad for the Republican Party. Uh, obviously that's for Republican Party leaders and members to sort out what's good for them politically. What we know is that this approach is bad for the American people. Yeah. About Sunday, is there any more you can tell us about the president's plans at the memorial service? Is he going to speak, and might we hear anything about gun control, like after uh, Newtown? I don't have a preview. Uh, hello, everyone. It's good to have you here today. Uh, another beautiful day here in Washington D.C., the nation's capital. Fabulous weather. Uh, I have a lot of toppers, and I'm going to top with this one. Uh, my first topper is. Let's see. Yes, I'll go in this order. On Monday, September 23rd, the Vice President and Dr. Jill Biden will travel to Colorado to view damage from recent flooding and survey recovery efforts there. The Vice President's office will be releasing additional information as we get closer to Monday. That's topper number one. Topper number two. On Tuesday, President Obama will travel to New York to attend the Clinton Global Initiative where he and President Clinton will engage in a conversation about the benefits and future of health care reform in America and access to quality health care around the globe. Uh, I know that was confusing. I said that he'll travel to New York. He will be in New York, as you know, uh, for the United Nations General Assembly. Secondly, as you all know, following on the announcement that he'll be having this conversation with former President Clinton uh, about the benefits and future of health care reform, uh, this conversation will take place one week before the health insurance marketplace is open for business, and Americans who do not currently have insurance will be able to sign up for affordable, quality health plans that meet their needs. This conversation between the two presidents will follow up on the health care speech President Clinton gave in Arkansas in early September and is part of a ramped up public education effort to reach Americans who want to sign up for new affordable options in the health insurance marketplaces from October through March. Finally, uh, <clears throat> today the Senate Judiciary Committee approved Nina Pillard's nomination to be a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. There are now two highly qualified nominees for this court pending before the full Senate, and we urge their prompt confirmation. 